It's a beautiful morning. And Ryan, that's a beautiful song. Thank you for leading that song. That always really helps me put my head in the right space before we take of the Lord's Supper. Um, forgive my tongue-in-cheek PowerPoint this morning, but this the sermon this morning is called Congratulations, You're Terrible, with a you're marked out, meaning we were terrible. And to show that, this is really the simple gospel message that we're going to look at this morning, but I hope by looking at Romans, a little bit of Romans 1, 2, and 3, we can get a clearer picture of the sad state we were in before Christ. And we can look at truly what it meant for Christ to be a propitiation for our sins. And that's not a word we use too much, but before we get into that, let's, let's do a little bit of reading. If you look with me, I have the verses on the PowerPoint, or you can read along in your Bible. In Romans 1 and verse 18, Paul tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In verse 26, it says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 29, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Now we read this passage, and a lot of time we look at this passage to kind of discuss the state or the current affairs of the world we live in today. And we look and we look at these verses and we say, oh, how far our society has fallen short of the glory of God. And yes, there is truth in that. But what I hope we all understand is you're on that list. I'm on that list too. This isn't speaking to some other subset of group and, oh, we're sitting here and we're so righteous and, yeah, God's going to punish those people. Paul's speaking to us. He's speaking to you and I. This is where we were. And I think we have committed the grave sin of convincing ourselves that we are mostly good. You know, for the most part, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, I, don't, I don't cheat my boss. I, I don't, uh, you know, go out drinking at the bars on the weekends with all my friends and partying it up. You know, I, I, I'm pretty good. I, I, I open the door for people. I, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm a good person. And I think we sometimes think that because, you know, when we read that list, well, I didn't murder anybody. You know, I don't cheat. I'm, I'm not ruthless. I'm a pretty empathetic person. So that's not me. But when we start looking at the words a little closer, what about gossips? you ever gossiped that really annoying person at work that everyone bad mouths or that person who did you wrong and man you want to get back at him and you just spread another rumor you heard about them or you say something to tear down another person's reputation or in your car when you're driving and someone cuts you off and the things that utter out of your mouth towards that person made in God's image that's been me and if I'm correct I'm guessing that's probably been you too at least at some point but I think we've made the mistake of kind of categorizing these sins of like, oh, it's, it's from most bad to, you know, not as bad. These are all bad. These are woefully inadequate compared to the high calling that God has given us, to the relationship that God wants to have for us. And this isn't a ranking system. It's God's holiness versus our unrighteousness. In verse 2, uh, or I'm sorry, in Romans 2 and verse 3, Paul says, do you so suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? He can't drive the point any more clear, like draw it home any more clearly than that. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. We have no place judging and saying, oh, these terrible people, that's you and that is me. And if we look in verse 8, it says, But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew f first, and also the Greek. Who here has uh, never been self-seeking? Raise your hand if you've never sought your own interest before. <laughs> 
That's not the case. We have all been self-seeking. I mean, even at the end of the day, sometimes I do good things, and then when I get to thinking about it, I think, man, maybe I did that good thing just because I don't want to feel bad about myself. And at the end of the day, maybe that's a selfish motivation. You see, uh, most of what we do seems to be self-seeking. And so guess what? That's inadequate for God's glory because God wants us to be selfless. He says, because of all these things, because of our selfish hearts, because of our murderous hearts, because of our angry, cheating, deceitful hearts, God's wrath is being revealed. Now, the Greek word on that is kind of interesting because the anger that's used to describe the emotion that God has towards this sin, it's not like a uh, volatile, you ever know someone who's just like real kind of on edge all the time like maybe it's a coworker or something who's just ready to snap at a moment's notice and just out of the blue they blow up like this huge angry tirade rant and maybe it's at you that's not this that's not godly anger the word is a swelling up it's like a precise anger it's not like god's just immediately flying off the handle because of sin it's been a problem since the world began of this sin that just keeps piling on top of each other and every man just keeps on continuing continuing in iniquity and that's not god's plan for creation that's not god's plan for you and i and so god is angry at what we have turned his creation into and what we have turned our lives into and you know we don't really feel comfortable talking about god's anger but god has love and anger and if you have children, I, I would suppose that you understand that emotion very well, that you love your children, but they drive you crazy sometimes. They make you angry when they disobey, when they do things that you know that, that's going to cause harm to them. That makes you angry. And what do you want? You want correction. You want them to do right. And continuing in verse 10, it says, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God all have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He's a little bit repetitive there, isn't he? But I think that's for a reason because he's trying to drive the point home. You and I, we are not righteous. We have been selfish. We are wrong in God's eyes. Verse 13 says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. I feel like that's, that describes me pretty well at, at my worst. When I, when I just really, I, I struggle with my words sometimes, and especially just being around people, sometimes it challenges you, and so, especially when people wrong you. You know, these things, I, I think they're things we all struggle with, especially the bitterness. We kind of spread that bitterness and that, langu- that bitter language with our mouths, and it's like a cancer we spread to other people. That's not God's plan. How many times have we used our ways, our words in such a way to cause harm to another person made in God's image? Because you think when we're doing that, who are we harming? Well, God, but also his creations. The same people that he created that he loved and that his son died for are the same people that we are cursing with our tongues and trying to drag down. But <laughs> with every bad news, there is good news. You see, we all were terrible. We are all inadequate of God's glory, but Paul gives us some good news here in verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God. Now, whose righteousness is this? It's God's righteousness, something that we can't even conceive how righteous and holy God is. It says, has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. He's speaking of the, of the uh, Old Testament in there. It says in verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. And I want you to think about that for a moment, that the righteousness of God can be found through faith in Jesus Christ. That it goes far beyond just making us good or making us decent people. That is the righteousness of of God that we are receiving because of the blood of Christ. But even though we have all been guilty and creation was evidence uh, enough, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, for proof of God's existence, and we know that God gave us our consciences to tell us in, in a way, in an imperfect way, what's right and what's wrong, and yet we don't even listen to that. <laughs> We've disobeyed our own hearts when they've condemned us. But what is our ultimate purpose? What did God create us for? 
Going back to Genesis, he tells us he made man in God's image. Our role is to be image bearers of God, and we've fallen so short of that. And God has made it correct through his son's blood. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And here's the challenge. I think we can all be decent people. <laughs> At least if we're not challenged too hard or tested too hard, we can be pretty decent, peop- decent people, but you know, just don't cross me. Right? Those kind of infantile attitudes we have. Oh, I'm nice until you cross me. Or I steal, but only from the rich. <laughs> it's like, what? That's, that's not how it works. We may think we're decent people, but I want you to think about it like in Revelation when it describes God and his throne and the myriads of angels who are singing to him night and day since time began. And to think that we can be counted righteous that we've all fallen short of the glory of god that goes far beyond just being decent even if we were like the best people on earth we couldn't match god's glory we can't match that level of holiness no matter how good we were i mean i don't care the most righteous person you know is so so far from god's holiness and his righteousness verse 24 it says and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Now this may seem like an abrupt picture from what we were talking about, but does anyone remember the mercy seat in the Old Testament when God describes the uh, on top of the ark of the covenant that there was this mercy seat. And if you look, there were, there were a lot of rules about this mercy seat that was in the most holy place in Leviticus 16 and verse 11. And why this is important, the word propiti- propitiation, I have a struggle saying with it, <laughs> saying that word, but that word actually gives in, it, it, it indicates the same language in a way that's used in Leviticus for the mercy seat or sacrifices regarding the mercy seat. So let's look at this to get better clarity of what Paul is trying to tell us here in this text. In Leviticus 16, 11, it says, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself and put the incense on the fire before the Lord in verse 13, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. Whoa, (laughs) I wouldn't want this job. Would you want this job? No, I I don't think you would. And in fact, there's some traditions and some teachings. I I don't know how accurate they are. They are historical though, that they used to put uh, bells around the high priest so they could hear if he got struck down by God, they'd hear his body collapse. And they'd also put a rope around his waist so that if he died in the most holy place, well, who's going to get the body, you know, because you're not supposed to go in the most holy place. So they had this rope that they could pull his body out of. See, it was a pretty scary position to be in, to be the high priest. Verse 15, it says, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil, because we know there was a veil that was covering the most holy place from the holy place. And they're supposed to carry this blood into the most holy holy place inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat see there's no other way that this high priest could enter the most holy place unless he came with the proper sacrifices with through the blood of this bull in this in this goat but why was there so much danger why was there so many precautions that they had to take before they entered into the most holy place Well, God tells them back in Exodus 25 and verse 21, it says, God says, and you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark and in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I shall give you there. I will what meet with you at the mercy seat is where God met mankind to consult, to consult with them, to give them his law, to pardon them of their sins. But there's a problem (laughs) because just sinful man can't enter into a relationship with God or be in the presence of God. And that's why God had all these sacrifices and atonements they had to make to enter into the most holy place. And this is not a new idea that this our sin separates and that it requires blood to enter into God's presence. Going back in Genesis three, verse nine, it says, but the Lord, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? 
And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Remember, they sinned and they were aware that they weren't wearing any clothes. And then God <laughs> comes, looks for them, and he knows where they are. <laughs> he says, where are you? And what was he doing? He was hiding from the presence of God. And that's a natural instinct because our sin separates our relationship with God. We can't be in unity with God when we are living in sin and something had to be done about it. In verse 25, he talks, speaking again of Jesus, he says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over a former sin. So that's the idea that we come before the mercy seat of God, of Jehovah, the great I am, who is glorious beyond measure, and we can come to him to receive mercy. Now, was it through perfect law keeping? Did we do everything perfectly? No, he's already told us how woefully inadequate we are. How are we able to enter into that most holy place? It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. He made us righteous. He made us share in the glory of God, not through works, not because of what we did, but by his grace as a free gift. It says it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God must be just. And that's something we, uh, that challenges us. But if you just think about a regular court system, right? If, if, some, if some thug stabbed your mom, right, and she unfortunately passed away, and then you go to court, and then the judge sits there and just says, ah, uh, well, he's, he's a pretty decent guy. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he gives a lot to charity, and for the most part, he doesn't lose, lose his temper, so I, I'm just going to let him go. Would you call that, that judge a just judge or an unrighteous judge? <laughs> he wouldn't be a good judge, would he? God is a just judge, so he has to deal with the sin. There's no just forgetting it or just pretending it never happened. If God, God wants to have a sincere relationship with you, so that sin has to be addressed. But he's also, he's the judge, he's just, and he's the justifier. And I love that old country saying, justified just as if I'd never sinned. And that's what it's like to be in the blood of Christ. When we are washed through baptism in the blood of Christ, to doubt your salvation, this is what I want to drive home especially, to doubt your salvation is to doubt the power of the blood of Jesus. Guess what? There's nothing you did to earn salvation. There's nothing you, you, you do that makes you more righteous. It is only through the blood of Christ alone that you are made righteous. And of course, that's not an excuse to not engage in good works or to be studying or do all those things. It's because that we are made righteous that we act as people of faith. Because to have faith requires faithfulness, as we're talking about in our, in our Hebrew study. That all of these people in Hebrews 11 that had faith, their faith led them to commit extraordinary acts that, that harmed the self at the time. It was a bodily sacrifice that they went through to exhibit their faith. Verse 27 says, then what becomes of our boasting? <laughs> what can we brag about, guys? What can we brag about our salvation? Nothing. It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. Let's live like it. Sincerely, let's live like it. No more excuses, no more pridefulness, no more ego, no more convincing ourselves that we're decent people. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. You and I are woefully flawed, but Jesus died so that we can be in the presence of God, having all of our sins dealt with and pardoned, not just turned a blind eye to, but pardoned. They are done. Let's remember to live like it and let us never deceive ourselves and believe that it was us who caused it. Let's pray uh, before we partake. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are just and the justifier. Father, there is nothing we could do to earn your love or your salvation, but your grace was a free gift to all of us. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to take of your son's body. Father, we are thankful that your son bore the wrath that you had for sin. And Father, that's a humbling thought and a, 
a thought and a thing that's really hard to comprehend for us as humans, the love that you must have to sacrifice your only begotten son that you love to bear that wrath. Father, let us be thankful for that. Let us be humbled by it. Help us have no form of self-righteousness as we partake. Please help us do it in a pleasing manner to you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the blood of your Son, that when we have been baptized and washed in your Son's blood and raised up again to newness of life, we are so thankful for the resurrection that you give us. Father, please help us be people of hope. Please help us remember as we partake of this that this life is material, that it's short and it's but a vapor, but you have given us eternal life through the blood that your son offered on this earth that he the creator became human father that your son walked in flesh and blood and left the splendors of heaven and the glory and the cherubim and the seraphim singing day and night he left that to walk on dirt paths to be reviled by humans by people like us who we know we would do the same thing because we have lived in stubbornness and opposition to your will Father, help us partake of this blood and realize all the things that it accomplishes for us in our lives and help us remind us to look forward to that day when we, we will be resurrected and once again in your presence. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen.